The other day, our favorite failed congressional candidate, Cenk Uger, tweeted out, This is important. Progressives are two-thirds of the country, according to polling. Mainstream media pretends they love corporate democratic policy when that is not at all the case. So yes, I fight against corporate Dems and right-wingers. He thinks those are the same thing, by the way. And now, right-wingers posing as the left. In that last part, I believe he's referring to Jimmy Dore, Glenn Greenwald, Aaron Maté, and their ilk. So, Jank is relying on issue polling as his evidence that two-thirds of Americans are progressive. As I've talked about before on this channel, there are a number of problems with his approach. Specifically, issue polls are not even necessarily supposed to be predictive of one's political behavior, nor do they tell us what someone's overall ideology is. For example, in my video, Why Do People Hate the Young Turks Part 2, I discussed how issue polling doesn't necessarily capture the intensity of an issue. Just because a lot of people say they want policy X in the abstract, doesn't mean that people necessarily care enough about that issue to inform themselves about it, much less vote for politicians that are in line with them. My go-to example for this has always been guns. Yes, it's true that gun control reforms usually poll well, but the people who are opposed to these measures are far more likely to vote against a politician who tries to implement them than the people who are for them are likely to vote in favor of such a politician. So, from the standpoint of political survival, it makes way more sense for those trying to win an election to be opposed to gun control and emphasize that, even though gun control measures are popular in the abstract. For the purposes of Jenks' tweet, and his rather audacious claim, just because progressive policy issues poll well doesn't mean that people really care about them or share Jenks underlying values. But I've come across one that I actually like better. It looks like President Biden plans to withdraw troops from Afghanistan on September 11th of this year, thus ending our longest war. According to some people, this is long overdue, and the fact that it hasn't happened sooner is political malpractice and an affront to the will of the people. After all, the Afghanistan war does not pull well. In fact, you might be surprised to find out that it actually pulls worse than a much better known war. Just so you know, a poll came out in 2013. This is an old poll now, but it's the most recent one I saw on this issue. And a, a whopping 17% of Americans still wanted to be in the war in Afghanistan. The war in Afghanistan was more unpopular than Vietnam. Think about that. If I was a Democrat running for president, I would bring this up all the time. So you probably have figured out where I'm going with this. All you need is a little knowledge of history to know that this is a specious comparison. There is absolutely no equivalence in the intensity of these issues. It's impossible to overstate the political, cultural, and societal impact of the Vietnam War. Meanwhile, the Afghanistan War is all but forgotten by most of the American public. Let's compare the two. But before we do, just take note of the fact that I'm not making a strategic or ethical judgment on either war. I'm talking about these conflicts purely from the standpoint of their impact on American politics and culture. I'm not talking about the morality or geopolitical ramifications of either. The Vietnam War occupies a particularly unique spot in American history. It was the first war in American history to be televised. Every night, Americans gathered around the TV and got daily updates. At this point in time, there were only three channels, so it's not as though you had the option to tune into something else. Many people, including Lyndon Johnson, believed that television was the main reason America lost the war. As Johnson told the National Association of Broadcasters, as I sat in my office last evening, waiting to speak, I thought of the many times each week when television brings the war into the American home. No one can say exactly what effect those vivid scenes had on American opinion. Historians must only guess at the effect that television would have had during earlier conflicts on the future of this nation. During the Korean War, for example, at that time when our forces were pushed back there to the Pusan, or World War II, the Battle of the Bulge, or when our men were slugging it out in Europe, or when most of our Air Force was shot down that day in June 1942 off Australia. LBJ, like many others, believed that Americans were less tolerant of the war effort because the horrors of combat were brought into their living rooms every night in a visual way. Johnson gave this speech on April 1st, 1968, the day after he shocked the nation by announcing that he would no longer be seeking re-election. Johnson won the New Hampshire primary, but Senator Eugene McCarthy, who had chosen to primary Johnson as an anti-war alternative, 
performed better than expected. This was treated by the media as an effective loss for Johnson. The crisis of confidence ultimately led Johnson to bow out of his re-election effort. Eugene McCarthy went into the convention in Chicago with the most support, but the delegates ultimately selected Vice President Hubert Humphrey as their candidate. In response, anti-war protesters started a riot outside of the convention, which caused Mayor Richard Daley to call in the National Guard. Humphrey went on to lose a close election to Richard Nixon. Many people believe that the convention riots cost Humphrey delegate Rich Illinois, and possibly the election on the whole. In response to the mess of the convention, the Democratic Party started the mcgovern Fraser Commission to examine their nomination process. This was the start of the democratization of the primary process. Republicans later followed suit. This is only scratching the surface of the political impact of the Vietnam War. It has arguably played a role in every presidential election since including 2020. While it was not emphasized that much, both Donald Trump and Joe Biden were accused of dodging the draft. And that brings us to another important facet of the Vietnam War. Vietnam also occupies a unique spot in American history in that we have not fought a war with a conscripted army since. Between the years of 1964 and 1973, about 2.2 million men were drafted into the military to go fight in Vietnam. The eligible pool of men over that time span was about 27 million. This meant that the realities of war could not be avoided by most of the population. Obviously, the prospect of getting drafted loomed over men of a certain age. But for nearly everyone else, else, there was the possibility that they were going to potentially lose their son, brother, father, boyfriend, husband, nephew, etc. to the war. This made the conflict nearly impossible to ignore, and it also fueled one of the largest protest and counterculture movements in the history of this country. Approximately 570,000 men were considered draft offenders by the federal government. Most famous among them was the heavyweight boxer and cultural icon Muhammad Ali. The impact of the war and the protest movement associated with it on American culture is staggering. Some of the most iconic songs in American history were written about the Vietnam War, largely in protest of it. It's difficult to know just how many songs were about the war, but according to a project called Vietnam War Songs, an incomplete discography, the number is in the thousands and ever-growing. When the first incomplete discography was published in 1993, it had about 550 entries. Four years later, that number had grown to over 800. C.L. Yarborough became a co-researcher in 2002, and his internet searches helped the listing past 2100 songs in early 2008. Frank Merrill's collection of 55,000 plus uncharted singles added approximately 1,200 new Vietnam titles in 2009. By the end of 2010, the discography listed over 4,100 entries, more than 3,000 unique titles, and was still growing. That same year, Justin Brummer, a UK-based researcher, began collaborating, providing titles, images, and audio for both old and newly recorded songs. With his invaluable additions, the discography had grown to over 6,000 entries by the end of 2018. I could not find a good list of films about the Vietnam War outside of Wikipedia. Their page has 176 titles. This includes movies that are explicitly about the war, like Apocalypse Now, and movies like Forrest Gump, where the war is prominently featured. The Vietnam War still makes a appearances in movies that were made relatively recently, like Kong Skull Island. Now let's consider the war in Afghanistan. Obviously there was no draft. All of the American military force there the whole time has been volunteer. What about the media coverage? Well, in 2009, the Project for Excellence in Journalism found that the Afghanistan war received just 2% of the news coverage that year. In 2019, the Washington Post published leaked documents known as the Afghanistan Papers, which received only minimal coverage. The war has occurred during the digital era, where one can consume digital media as much as they want and still avoid news coverage entirely. What about the cultural impact? Just like the Vietnam War, it's difficult to find a definitive list of songs, but Spotify does have a small playlist about the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. They don't strike me as nearly as iconic as the songs about Vietnam. Obviously, the Afghanistan War is more recent than Vietnam, so it doesn't have as much time in the film department. According to Wikipedia, there are 39 movies where the Afghanistan War is prominently featured. It could catch up to Vietnam, but I'm skeptical. Let's also consider the context in which these wars happened. The Afghanistan War was part of the War on Terror. This started because of 9-11, which is as significant a moment in the history of this country as any. The fear of terrorism was a very real animating force in American politics for years after that, which is why there was a great deal of support for the Afghanistan War when it first started. Eventually, people started to consider it the good war in comparison to the war in Iraq, 
which eventually overshadowed it. The Vietnam War happened in the context of the Cold War. There was no single event during the Cold War that shook the United States quite like 9-11, the closest probably being the Bay of Pigs. But the threat of communism was ultimately more existential than the threat of terrorism. Terrorism was a threat, of course, and it still is, but Islamic fundamentalism has never been seen as a model which could rival the United States the way that the communism of Soviet Russia was. Given that the Soviet Union was both a nuclear and space age power, the Russians overtaking America as the world's most powerful country did seem like a possibility. Now, let me be very clear here. I am not, in any way, shape, or form, denigrating anyone who fought in either of these wars. I am not trying to minimize the deaths, trauma, or injuries of anyone in either conflict. I'm not even speaking to the morality or geopolitical significance of them either. I'm looking at them purely from the standpoint of the effect each had on American society, politics, and culture. From this perspective, the Vietnam War was far more important than the Afghanistan War. When people talk about how the Afghanistan War polls worse than Vietnam, they're right. According to Politico, less than one in five support the war in Afghanistan in a new CNN ORC international poll at 17% and 82% opposed the conflict. In CNN's previous polling, while troops were still engaged there, opposition to the fighting in Iraq was never higher than 69%, and belief that the Vietnam War was a mistake was never higher than 60%. If you ask people in the abstract what they think about either war, the conflict in Afghanistan performs worse. And that means absolutely nothing. That's the point of this video. Opinion polls cannot capture the role these wars played in American politics, and how significant each one was respectively. While the contrast may not be as stark with other issues as it is with these two wars, this problem exists with issue polling on everything. Statistical abstractions about how many Americans approve of this issue or that issue says nothing about the importance of it to voters or how it affects their political behavior, if it does at all. And comparing these two wars and the supposed unpopularity of one of them over the other is my new favorite example of that. An opinion poll in a quarter will buy you a phone call. That's about it. For men my father's age, the Vietnam War was the defining political issue of its time. For men my age, Afghanistan wasn't even the most important war. Mm.